We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. that they are that way because you're Joe Flacco. And you just like to discredit things that people deserve credit for. That you can't possibly be expected to defend that. Talk about the game, Sam. So Who cares about what people think about us? Yeah, I like football, I like football season, all the things that go with it. Welcome in to the PFF NFL podcast. Steve Palazzolo, Sam Monson, back with you, breaking down all things NFL. What are you laughing at, Sam? Uh, just the idea that you might roll in one day with uh, with blackness back in your hair. You know, the yeah. the whatever white thing you got going on now, the salt and pepper deal just disappears. Maybe we're going to bring back a little bit more of the pepper at some point. We'll see. Right? Okay. Is that right? Yeah. Well, welcome in. Sam, still down in Florida. Uh, we apologize if the audio is not great for Sam. It's your fault. Yes. No, no, no. It's your fault because I asked. I was in this room, which echoes like, like it's not good. Um, and I was like, is the audio okay? And you people in the studio you with people. the equipment to check me were like, no, no, it sounds fine. Yeah. In my, in my earpiece, in my IFB, it sounds pretty good. It does sound pretty good. Just but other people it all your fault maybe, i was uh, on top of it i was asking the question i was like it sounds pretty bad to me in here right now and you're like no no it's fine don't worry what's going on outside the uh the studio here tyler is there like we got a tour going on there's a tour there's people in suits here are these sponsors wow. is this the sponsors invite, you, sponsors invite them in. in see the show do you guys want to see us live we got a spare chair invite them in put them up yeah let's do it get on here Anyway, what are we talking about today? Let's do a little salary cap health per our friend Brad Spielberger. He wrote a full article mm -hmm. over at PFF.com uh, looking at the financial, the cap health of all 32 teams. I think this is a great way to break down teams beyond just kind of like, hey, how much salary cap space do you have left? Dude, there are right. short and long-term implications to take a look at here, and I think Brad did a really nice job breaking that all down. He did. So we'll talk about that. We had a lot of emails come in as well, a couple of topics there. And in particular, the quarterbacks as sandwiches thing has inspired, inspired the listeners, inspired the mailbag. The first one <laughs> came in from somebody called Charles Butler, who starts off saying you have to pause the podcast to fire in these comps. That's how <laughs> that's how much it inspired him. Uh, hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed listening. Um, and then sorry. So Jameis Winston is the Monte Cristo, a battered, dipped, deep fried ham and cheese sandwich that has all the right stuff and sounds amazing, but will probably give you a stomach ache. I think that's a pretty good one. Um, that is good. Sam Darnold is American cheese between two slices of Wonder Bread. Technically, it's a sandwich, but it's not really going to do much for you. Uh, and Josh Allen is a meatball sub, and he thinks that's self-explanatory. So I think mm, pretty good. That's good. I will accept other uh, sandwich requests because I think we had some, there were some tweets, there were some emails. I'll take other uh, sandwich suggestions, I should say, for, uh, for quarterbacks. Mm. I think everybody, though, agrees that Kylo Murray is a slider. I think that's the one that unites everybody. Yeah. Because he slides so well? No, no, no. He's a baseball tiny, player? Teeny tiny. Oh, okay. I was going to say, it could be a double entendre. Guy knows how, he's an outfielder, knows how to slide. Uh, before we get into more great sandwich discussion and, of course, the salary cap health of all 32 teams, the best place to play fantasy football this summer is Underdog Fantasy. Their best ball media tournament has $10 million in total prize money. That's right, $10 million. And the best part is you just draft your fantasy football team and that's it. There's no waivers, no trades, no in-season management. Underdog gives you your best score each week of the season and the highest scores 
of the at the end of the year will win. It sounds pretty simple. The champion of Best Ball Mania drafted last year, right here in June. So there's no time like the present to join Underdog. Take your shot at a million dollar draft. Plus, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to one hundred dollars when you sign up with the promo code PFF. Also, if you play ten of those dollars using promo code PFF. You get a free PFF subscription. So what are you waiting for? Head to underdogfantasy.com or go to the App Store. Play $10 with code PFF and draft your best ball mania team today. Dude, that's a deal. That is a deal. Matching $100, free PFF subscription, chance to win all kinds of money with a lazy fantasy football game. You know, don't have to lazy. work at it. Just yeah. draft and let it go. That's my kind of game. Yeah, and you know, best ball has its own different type of strategy, right? You don't you don't worry as much about injury concerns. You kind of chase an upside. You can draft multiple teams and kind of hedge a little bit. I mean, I think there's a it's a whole different world. But again, you just kind of throw all your entries in, and like the guy in last year that won in June, never know. Ten million dollars mm-hmm. up for grabs here over at underdogfantasy.com or in the app store. Were there any other uh, sandwich uh, suggestions here, Sam? There were many other sandwich suggestions, but that's the one that I decided to to bring in just to update people with the email. All right. Do we want to get into uh, the salary cap stuff or or then we'll we'll wrap it up with emails? Sure. All right. Somebody sent us some hate, man. Not, well, it wasn't, wasn't us. It was mostly anybody, not me at PFF. Yeah. Yeah. We'll read that one later. That was fun. We'll get to that later. Steve's cool. Everyone else hates my team. Cut it out. That was the, that's the gist of it. We'll get to that later. Um, but let's go three year. So the, it's the three year salary cap analysis of all 32 teams. Again, Brad Spielberger, we hired him a couple of years ago after he graduated from law school and was working with our friends over at Over the Cap. We didn't really, you know, yank him away from Over the Cap. We're friends with uh, Jason Fitzgerald over there. And uh, Over the Cap does a fantastic job. They are the number one place for all of your NFL salary cap information, data, team-wise, player-wise, contract breakdowns, all of that fun stuff. Um, But Brad came over here a couple of years ago. We've had him on the show, and he has done a fantastic job just adding a different element to what we do here, bringing that financial aspect, the salary cap view, the contract breakdown view. He's done a great job uh, projecting contracts using PFF data and historical precedent and all that stuff. And you can read all of his work over at pff.com as he goes through the teams that have the best three-year outlook as far as the salary cap goes. Because, again, Sam, these are the types of things that are happening within front offices, right? You're, you're looking at uh, what do we have to do going forward, who's on our team currently. Uh, over the cap, as I mentioned, they are the spot. They are awesome for what they do as far as showing salary cap breakdowns. But uh, evaluating salary cap health is more than just going to over the cap and saying, who has the most cap space, right? uh, Fans can do that. That's a great starting point. But a guy like Brad can go in, dissect it a little bit more, and take more of a forward-looking approach. Yeah, and, you know, he has one big kind of overarching table, um, conditionally formatted, always a win, on this article that kind of shows you the, what, one to five categories, effectively, that are all rolled into one for this purposes to kind of create this overall cap health rank um so obviously like you said it's more than just you know how much salary cap space does your team have right this second which is effectively an accounting snapshot right like we talk all the time about how the saints manage their cap and treat it like a credit card and it's not that they're ever you know um it's not that they're playing way beyond their means it's that they, they, they just treat it like the credit card and they max out the credit card and then they pay off the credit card every you know every month or every year for the saints um as opposed to other teams who use the use the salary cap more like a debit card right and just make sure you never go over the money's always coming immediately out of your account etc cetera, etc cetera. so the actual salary cap space is just a kind of snapshot arbitrary you know one moment in time kind of deal this piece the salary cap space element of it is a three-year window of effective salary cap space and not just this one moment snapshot but like a three-year look um but then added to that we've got you know the the val- the veteran valuation of the top 51 guys in your roster so how much uh, money have you got tied up in key players uh how much 
um, money you have in players that are going to be 2023 free agents. So next year's free agents um, and, and all those kind of things. So I, it's, it's all of these things folded up together to create a much better and more complete look of where a team's salary cap is, not just right this moment, but like over the next couple of years. Uh, so, you know, again, go read the article over at pff.com. We'll, we'll break down some of the, the highlights. Uh, the, the team with the best salary cap health, though, by, this, by these various metrics, when you roll them all into one, is the Cincinnati Bengals, who yeah. are number one in this list. You mentioned the New Orleans Saints. They're 32nd. Um, and again, remember, there's a difference in when we talk salary caps. It's not, can this team get under the cap? It is, but it is, what can you do? with your cap space, right? Like what, right. How, can you add players? Can you maintain players? And some of the Saints numbers uh, are, are pretty hilarious. So, so say like effective <clears throat> cap space for 2022 to 24, you have some teams that are in nine figures, you know, over 200 million, over 274 million for the, for the Bears, over 218 million for the Houston Texans. The Saints are the only one in the red with uh, negative 12 million of effective cap space 2022 to 24 now again they kind of find ways to, they, they move around on this list a little bit by manipulating things it is just funny how at any given point the saints are completely stretched to the max and it does hinder them right you can't always maintain and keep the players that you want when you are stretched that thin yeah the saints to me might be the only team that kind of break this a little bit because of the the way that they treat the cap because they're so unique in how they do it um it's not that you know you get all these people that are like oh the salary cap isn't real it's a myth it's you know it's just a you can manipulate it and blah blah and you can but you're right it does there are limits to that right and there are times where the saints have had to cut players that they would have liked to keep because of the financial constraints and then they kind of reload and they go again. Um, but because they do that and because they're so used to doing that and it's built into the process, you know, it's, it's part of the gig, right? So yes, the saints have a terrible salary cap situation and they have no money for the next few years. They have a ton of players that are going to hit free agency. They don't have, or, and, and all those kinds of things. Um, but that, that's kind of baked into the plan, right? Like they know this, this is not, it's not like Dallas, for example, where the Cowboys seem perpetually surprised by the contract situations that emerge, you know? It's like, oh, wow, we didn't, we didn't plan on having to pay this guy. Well, you paid him three years ago. Like, how did you think this was gonna go? You've had, like, these numbers have been on the ledger since he signed his contract. Like, how is this a shock to you now? Whereas the Saints, like the numbers are the same, right? The the impact is the same, like these giant numbers coming down the pike that they've sort of made their bed with three years ago, but they're aware of it, it's planned. And okay, it, may, it might mean they need to cut a few players and a few starters and, you know, actually important players in that roster, but they plan for that and they expect it and they know that they're gonna have to go and replace them and find new guys. So to me, the Saints are the one team on certainly on the bottom half of this list where I think it doesn't, I mean, I guess it, it does sort of represent the truth, but I think they're, they're prepared and they deliberately plan to deal with that. Uh, the one thing that stood out to me when I looked at the top 10 in cap health rank is how many teams have the beautiful first contract quarterback, right? A right. Recently drafted first rounder in most cases, but we mentioned the Bengals being number one. The New England Patriots come in at number three, despite their spending spree just two years ago in free agency, where they paid a ridiculous amount of money for players. That's that's the thing that stood out to me is yeah. you know the Steve prognostication of well you know this is great now, but in a couple of years this is going to be crippling. Doesn't appear to be true because right, they have Mac Jones at quarterback now. They have a first they have a first contract quarterback. My issue is still going to be. If you're if you're paying over ten million dollars for John New Smith and Nelson Aguilar and all that stuff, I mean it's not like you you could have used that money elsewhere if those guys aren't producing, right? It's not like all of the deals are still looking good, but yeah, maybe they're not as cap. Uh, but they but here's the thing: last year they didn't do nearly as much this past off season hmm. leading into 2023. So I think I think what they what the Patriots are doing are these ebbs and flows of like overspend and then old school. Patriots where you just kind of grab, you know, are on the edges. Maybe there's another spending spree available for New England 
but I don't think they've had the year to year flexibility that they're used to having either. Maybe. Um, I think there's also something to the idea that, you know, the, the group they brought in last year didn't necessarily set the world alight and maybe they're banking on those guys being better in a, in a second year in the system. Um, you know, certainly the way they use the tight ends last year was weird having made each of them, you know, the joint third best paid tight end in the NFL. And then John o. Smith barely featured Hunter Henry didn't have the, the best deployment in the world. Maybe they're expecting that to be a better thing next year. Um, the other thing that stood out to me, you're right. The rookie quarterbacks are a big part of this. And obviously if you have a quarterback on a rookie deal, your salary cap is going to be in better health than teams that don't have that. But the other thing that left out was just how many good teams are situated well, right? Like there's something to not just constructing a team and, and being able to contend and throwing yourself all in and, you know, using up the salary cap to get yourself in a position where you can win a Super Bowl. But how many of these teams are like genuine contenders um, and have been in a good spot for a while, have spent money and are still in a great salary cap position? The Indianapolis Colts. They have the fourth, they're ranked number th uh, four on overall salary cap health. The Colts have spent money. Like they've had one of the best salary cap situations for a number of years. They spent money. They've been out there um, dealing. They br brought in big players. Okay, some of them haven't worked out. You know, the Carson Wentz thing, the Matt Ryan thing um, over the last couple of years, they've, they've been out there trying to turn this team into a contender and they still have one of the best salary cap situations in the entire league. Um, and they're not alone, right? The Chargers have been on this big spending spree, right? We've, this offseason in particular, they've made tons of moves and that has dramatically reduced their uh, effective camp space for the next couple of years. But they're still in a really good situation because they have almost nobody turning free agent next year. Everybody's locked up um, and they have the quarterback on the rookie contract. Uh, who else in there? Baltimore, perennial contenders, Kansas City, with the Patrick Mahomes deal, the $500 million contract, half a billion dollars, they're still number 11. They're still in a good situation. So and that's I think why it they sort traded, of shows you. That's why they yeah, traded Tyree Kill. I think it shows you, though, how important it is to have guys in the organization or heading the organization that understand this stuff because you can still spend money, you can still be aggressive, you can still make a ton of moves and have a healthy salary cap situation if you know what you're doing. The, the teams with the rookie quarterbacks, though, so just to go through all of them again, Bengals are one, New England Patriots are three, the Chargers are at five. And the Chargers are at five after trading for Khalil Mack and signing J.C. Yeah. Jackson and some of these big moves, right? New York Jets are at six, the Miami Dolphins are at seven. Uh, technically, Lamar's still on his first contract, so the Ravens at eight. Giants have Daniel Jones, he's at nine. The Steelers lose Ben Roethlisberger, now it's Kenny Pickett in, in – Mitch Trubisky's basically making backup QB money, like high-end backup money uh, nowadays. So the Steelers are at 10. The Chiefs are the first team where it's like, okay, we paid a ton of money for our quarterback and we're in good cap health here at number 11. But then the bottom of the, the, bottom of the list, you do have several teams like the Raiders, the Packers, the Rams, the Cowboys, all teams that have invested heavily at the quarterback position. I guess those concerning teams that are in the bottom 10 – are teams like Carolina that yeah. don't have – I mean, they don't have – they paid money for Sam Darnold and they have, you know, a rookie third rounder. But um, Jacksonville's at 24, They you know, with Trevor Lawrence. So there, there are some teams. The Houston Texans don't have good salary cap health despite not having good players. You know, that's not a good place to be. But a team like the Packers, they're expected to be there. The Rams, they're expected to be there. Some of these teams that are paying their quarterbacks and are going for it, so to speak. But – um, that's what's interesting to me is the teams at the top have the rookie quarterbacks, have this cap flexibility. Eventually, they're going to have to pay their guy within the next two to three years. you got to pay Justin Herbert and Mac Jones and Burrow and all that stuff, but they're in this good spot for the foreseeable future and also uh, leaving that space available to eventually sign their quarterback. But if you're on the bottom end and you have a rookie quarterback, you're in a rough spot then. Yeah, you can see a few things from the bottom end of the list. You can see one – the teams that have had to pay their quarterback already, right? And just have a have a ton of money tied up in that one position and, and all the restrictions that that brings you generally. Um, you can see the teams that are at the start of or in the middle of a massive, you know, foundations up rebuild, right? So Houston, 
Houston have one of the, the largest, the third most effective cap space in the next couple of years because they cleared everybody off the roster in the last you know year or so with uh, Nick Casario running the show. They haven't been investing in free agency. They've been bringing in a lot of players, but they've been low price guys and they've just been treading water with the roster. So they've basically just started this project. They have an absolute ton of cap space over the next couple of years. But the flip side of that is they have almost nobody locked down in terms of long-term building blocks of this roster. Chicago is a little bit further behind Houston, um, but the same kind of idea. Like this offseason with Ryan Poles has been about, let's clear space. So they have the most cap space in the NFL over the next couple of years. But the flip side of that is they have the fewest or the, the smallest amount of money tied up in any long-term building blocks of any team. So that is like, in terms of that metaphor we always use, they have stripped this thing all the way back. This is back to bare metal. It's back to foundations, the concrete slab on the floor. They're now looking for brick number one, right? And maybe that's Justin Fields or, or maybe it's the next guy, but they have start. this is the starting point of that foundation. And you can see that in the bottom half of this team. And then you can see just badly run teams you know teams that don't have a ton of money tied up in the quarterback that aren't in the midst of a rebuild and are in the bottom part portion of this list because they just haven't managed the money well so jacksonville uh carolina atlanta with all the dead money tied up in matt ryan etc like these are teams that just have not managed this thing well and are situated somewhere in the bottom uh, half bottom third of this list atlanta they just they've basically hit the reset button as well much like the chicago bears right i mean as far as right but their problem is they would have been there whether or not they were doing that you know what i mean True. like if they kept matt ryan and we were still sort of muddling along and saying well they haven't quite started a rebuild yet blah blah, blah they still would stink in terms of salary cap health they were trying to push it along as far as they could moving on from matt ryan was the right move, I think, for the Falcons to at least start this. But yeah, they're going to be – they're digging out of a hole, right, with all the, the dead cap space that they have yeah. at the moment. I, I thought one of the notes that Brad added here when, uh, when he was talking about the Cincinnati Bengals – and look, there's a reason why we really liked the Cincinnati Bengals offseason, right? From an, they, they, they had a huge need on the offensive line. We pegged it before the season – Every year before free agency, when we're trying to fit, when we're fixing every team in five minutes, LOL, we're saying stuff like, oh, you need three offensive line starters? Go to the middle of the PFF free agency list. Go to mm -hmm. players 50 through 75 to 100, whatever it is. Grab some of those players for pennies on the dollar. And they're usually pretty good starters. You could find a starting guard. You could find a starting uh, right tackle or whatever it might be. But this nugget is just incredible. The fact that the Bengals this offseason added center, Ted Karras, guard Alex Kappa right tackle Lyle Collins they're going to make 21.75 million per year under 22 million per year that figure alone would rank fourth among left tackles in the NFL and, and so that's why a team like the Bengals is sitting there at number one that's why a team like the Bengals we're complimenting their offseason when you can essentially get at a position that we always talk about as a weak link position, creep back toward average, just be good and solid across the board. The Bengals getting three starters, two in free agency, one Lyle Collins after getting released and, and being patient there, three starters for the price of, say, the fourth highest paid left tackle, I think is incredible business. And also goes back to like, hey, I like having a good left tackle. I love having a Trent Williams. I like having a Tyron Smith. Yeah, I love having those guys there. They're extremely valuable for their team, but also why you you have to be careful once you start throwing over $20 million a year to one player because there are other deals to be had. And I think, again, the Bengals this offseason, um, clearly based off this ranking and the actual players that they brought in and the price just did a fantastic job of understanding how to turn a weakness into at least pretty good when it comes to the offensive line in Cincinnati now. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we, I think the Bengals have been a model of doing things the right way the last few years now. Um, obviously, it all starts with hitting on Joe Burrow at the top of the draft and, you know, pick number one. That's, it's, again, it's, it's one of those, it's a layoff, right? It's like the, the Jets draft this year. 
but you can miss a layup, right? You can do something stupid. Um, so you, you bring in Joe Burrow, that starts your, your build and everything goes in the right direction. Two teams that I think are worth highlighting because they don't have the luxury of the rookie quarterback contract, um, which a lot of these other teams in good health do. The Kansas City Chiefs and the Buffalo Bills. The Chiefs are 11, the Bills yeah. are 15. They have both given their quarterback the monster deal, right? Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Mahomes with his half billion dollar contract, uh, Josh Allen with just his big money deal. Um, and they are still in good salary cap health. Like obviously they're not in as good a situation as a team that has a quarterback and a rookie deal, but they still have flexibility. They still have a decent situation long-term over the next three years. They're not in a spot where you're like, oh, wow, that deal is about to completely cripple this team and their window is closing. You know, they have structured this in, a, in such a way that, yeah, look, we're going to have to pay our quarterback a ton of money. On the other hand, he's Josh Allen or he's Patrick Mahomes. He's worth it. So let's just make sure we structure everything else around him so that this functions well. And look, this is why, you know, we're not rehashing this again because we spent hours arguing this one point in this offseason but that's why i think the chiefs had the flexibility to keep tyree kill and not you know be hard up against it because you look at them they did right they're 11th with tyree kills deal off the books obviously they'd be lower with it but they're still within the margin of errors um buffalo they've done a great job like building around josh allen and that's part of it is they've done that without crippling their salary cap without mortgaging the future for like the next two years. These two teams should be contenders in the AFC essentially for the duration of these long-term contracts that they've handed their quarterback. I did just try to send a note to Brad live here on the show if he could venture a guess as to where the Chiefs would rank if they had kept Tyree Kill. Because Let's I think that's can come back and say 32nd. If he says 32nd, not not to I'm not testing you on it. I'm just I'm really curious, right? I mean that one move the guy that we've broken down left and right about what he brings on the field and how he changes the game and how Kansas City's replacing him with multiple players, and that was a move they decided they had to make. Does their salary cap health really go from 30th to 11th? I mean, and so that just puts into perspective the, the thought process, right? The need to make that move. In addition to maybe saying, hey, here's this guy with incredible speed. If he loses one little step as he gets older, you know, maybe he's not the same player. All these different things that needed to be considered uh, by the Chiefs here. The team, uh, But I also love that you mentioned the Bills sitting there at 15, right? And so part of having those monster contracts is they, because you have long-term contracts and you threw a ton of money into them, they also baked in a lot of flexibility, the Bills and the Chiefs and the ability to move money around um, and not be um, not be completely hamstrung by the cap uh, every single year. So Buffalo being 15th, KC being 11th, obviously bodes well for them maintaining their status. Um, I mean, I think overall it show it proves that you know ha having to give the quarterback that that giant contract, it isn't the end, right? Like it doesn't the window doesn't close just because you lose that cheat code of the rookie of the great quarterback on the rookie contract it obviously gets harder but you can still have a salary cap in really good health whilst being contenders whilst having a ton of money tied up in the quarterback position and those two teams like they're the model right now for everybody else in the nfl going forward is find an elite quarterback pay him the money and still maintain a good enough team around him that you're able to contend year on year were you surprised to see the Washington Commanders at number two on this list? Because I mentioned all of the teams that had first contract quarterbacks. Well, the Commanders just traded for Carson Wentz and his contract, which isn't, um, you know, it's not up in that $40 million a, a year range that uh, a lot of quarterbacks are getting. Uh, the Wentz contract is still in the high end for quarterbacks, but you're still talking about it. That's going to be a mid-tier contract soon. You know, quarterbacks making 28 to $32 million will eventually be middle of the pack. But the Commanders, a team that hasn't gone, you know, they've, they've added free agents, they've drafted, they've, they've sprinkled in players from all over the place, and they're sitting here number two as far as cap health goes. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I wonder, they're another team that I wonder with one deal, how much that moves, you know, when they eventually give Terry McLaurin a big contract, I wonder how much that will hurt their, their 
spot in this ranking. They they might move down a little bit, but yeah, it is. They're they're another one of those sort of outlier teams that doesn't quite fit the the patterns that everybody else has in the in that area of the rankings. Yeah, and the Commanders a team that I thought you know last year when you're when you're looking at their roster, we thought they had the best young defensive line in the NFL. You have Chase Young battling injuries last season but they're still really good up front. The secondary overall disappointed. But when you go up and down the roster, you've got a solid offensive line. You have a good group of receivers. There is a lot to like about this Washington roster. And, you know, Mm -hmm. if Carson Wentz does upgrade what they had over pretty much Taylor Haneke for the majority of last season, we could be sleeping on Washington a little bit, not just for this year, but also with what they're able to do as far as the future goes. Um, The one other team to highlight I want to say is Cleveland – they're at number 21 as far as cap health goes. There was a period in time, Cleveland at 21 and now Jacksonville at 24. There was a period of time where both of those teams, remember like when you would look at over the cap, it was, it was the Colts, it was the Browns, it was the Jaguars who are sitting there with just a ton of cap space for like a two or three year window. Mm-hmm. And the Colts are still sitting there with a lot of cap flexibility, but the Browns have spent obviously we know what they've spent with Deshaun Watson but other places are along the roster as well and then with the Jaguars the spending spree that they had on the Christian Kirks of the world and uh you know some of the other lower end free agents maybe that they overpaid just a little bit but it it is interesting seeing the Jaguars and the Browns teams that for a couple years in our free agency analysis it's like when are these guys going to spend when where are they going to spend all this money we've started to see that over these last couple seasons yeah um and consequently no team in the nfl has more money tied up in those 51 top veteran contracts than the browns they've spent money but they have at least locked up the key parts of you know a contending caliber roster long term you know this is a team that is in a good position to be successful for a multiple year window assuming they can get a starting quarterback and you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure what it says about Cleveland um, exactly if Deshaun Watson gets suspended for the entire year or something. But if this team, having assembled the roster that they have, winds up with Jacoby Brissett as their starting quarterback for the entirety of 2022, like they just set fire to a year of Super Bowl contending window. I want to say for literally no reason, because the idea for them, I'm sure, is that, hey, you know, even if Watson misses a year, we still have multiple other years within there. But it, it would it would be quite something for a team to effectively burn a year of a Super Bowl window um, in that fashion. Uh, one more team I want to highlight too: Miami Dolphins. <laughs> Sorry, it's all AFC. All we talk about is the AFC. The Dolphins are at seven, Sam, and I mentioned them earlier because they do have the first. They, they have two, right? You have a first contract quarterback, but. Are, are are we sleeping on the Dolphins too? Not not sleeping on them completely, but like when you're talking about the AFC and the the addition of Tyree Kill, as much as we talked about, well, you, you know, you can't afford Tyree Kill if you're the Chiefs. Well, the Dolphins are affording him right now, in part because you have Tua's contract. But the Dolphins added to Ron Armstead, they added Tyree Kill, they added big names. You have a ton of money locked up in Xavier Howard and Byron Jones at the cornerback position. The Dolphins are spending at premium positions building a good solid roster their biggest question mark was the offensive line they're not doing it as shrewdly maybe as the Bengals but this offensive line adding to Ron Armstead and Connor Williams should be much better are the Dolphins this team that has done it right because of how much they've drafted and then spent the money in the right places where when they've when they've decided to spend yeah, um, Miami's thing is, so obviously two on the rookie contract, but they've had one of the largest uh, kind of draft capital um, collections of anybody in recent years, right? They've had all these first round picks. They haven't necessarily spent them all wisely, but they've had a ton of draft capital. And consequently, they have a ton of people on the roster on those rookie contracts. Um, now, some of them need to pan out, right? Like we saw... Jalen Phillips last year, I think he had a double digit sack rookie season. So a lot of people think he had a really good year, but it didn't, it wasn't reflected in pressure numbers, pressure rate, PFF grade, all those kinds of things. The 10 sacks thing flatters him, right? So Jalen Phillips needs to step up and show that he can be a high level uh, impact pass rusher in year two and beyond. 
they have a few players like that. But if those guys do pan out, they're in a good situation for a couple of years. Then all those contracts come up and, you know, those rookies need to turn into high money veterans. And that's where their salary cap health gets an awful lot trickier to maintain. Any other teams you want to highlight before we move on and talk no, about I'm, our friends I'm and Manscaped? highlighting teams. Okay. The people at Manscaped have uh, stepped up once again. Gentlemen, all men strive for gold in their life, right? Gold medals, gold watches, gold everything. But Sam, there's a certain type of man who goes the extra mile. He walks with co the confidence of an eagle and giggles in the face of danger. <laughs> He's a big, hairless, winning machine. When, when he unzips his pants, he sees platinum. That's right. Manscaped will like, would like to introduce you to their biggest and best ultimate hygiene bundle yet. It's the Platinum Package 4.0. That's right. Manscaped is the leader in below-the-waist grooming. Now trust them with the whole shebang. Join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the code PFF. Manscaped's brand new Platinum Package 4.0 is the biggest bundle they've ever offered, giving you a bulk discount on Manscaped's top products. That's right. 20% off free shipping with the code PFF at manscaped.com. It's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code PFF. It's time you enjoyed the finer things in life and get yourself a platinum package for your platinum package. Beautiful. The most precious metal, platinum, not yes. gold. Go for the platinum. That's right. That's why. Platinum 4.0. Good for Manscaped. Appreciate you guys. Good writing. Good write up again. All right, where are we going with? Uh, we got emails. Yeah, you want to do this email about how everyone else sucks and you're okay? I'm ready for it. Yes. I've entitled this one "An Ode to PFF Hating the Raiders." Oh. Um, Sam and Steve just wanted to comment on the PFF offensive line rankings from Mike Renner. It's ludicrous to rank the Las Vegas Raiders offensive line as "quote unquote" problematic. That was one of his labels for his tears. Uh, same old PFF bias against the Raiders. I think Mike Renner should have followed his own grading system and ranked the Raiders offensive line under the tier four group, quote unquote, at least one good tackle. Yep. This would rank them between 18 and 24, which I think is more accurate. A fault of Mike Renner and PFF is you do not like to admit your errors on a player evaluation like on Colton Miller. John Gruden was right. PFF was wrong. Colton Miller is a good left tackle. PFF overall grade, 84 in 2021. Secondly, Mike Renner and PFF do not want to admit the possibility that a player PFF said was a massive reach, Alex Leatherwood, might actually have improved and can play as a reasonable right tackle in year two. Admitting that makes Mike Renner and PFF look foolish, hence the real reason for the too low grading to save your embarrassment. Thirdly, Mike Renner has listed rookie Dylan Parham as right guard. This is wrong. Dylan Parham has been practicing with the second team. Far more likely to play at left guard is John Simpson with Denzel Good at right guard. Backup guard Leston Cotton also, Lester Cotton also appears ahead of Dylan Parham. Fourthly, there is the perennial PFF love affair with the Los Angeles Chargers and the Denver Broncos. I need to remind PFF that in 2020 and 2021, PFF predicted both teams would be better than the Raiders. PFF wrong again. Steve. I think you're always fair towards the Raiders, but it's high time for PFF to drop the institutional bias against the Las Vegas Raiders. Best wishes, Paul Cooper, Raiders fan from England. So I was going to you know, read that and then, be, <clears throat> and then ask you how you responded, but apparently you're the only person that doesn't need to respond. To I don't that. need to respond. So I'm on board. Go I'll Raiders. give it a shot. Um, let me see. Number one. <laughs> Number one, we don't like to admit our errors on player evaluation. I mean... We don't like it, but I think we do it fairly regularly. Like, we have admitted that Colt Miller is a good left tackle. Like, that is the one pick, the one reach in the John Gruden, Mike Mayock era that they have actually worked out with, that they have been proved right on. They they drafted Colton Miller. We didn't like it. He was rough year one, and then from year two on, he's developed, and he's gotten better, and he is a very good left tackle right now. Uh, let me just stay on that point for now, though. Um, yes. As a Raiders fan that I am, I'll say, yeah, yeah, Colton Miller's a good left tackle. I think you could also go back and say it still wasn't a good pick necessarily because Colton Miller, using PFF wins above replacement, has not had positive war until year four of his career. He's gotten progressively better. 
we didn't hate Colton Miller as a prospect. Wouldn't have taken him at what seventeen was it? Was he? Yeah, no, uh, fifteen so. overall. <laughs> um, but it took him to it took him till year four to become uh, as good as he is. So it depends on how you want to weigh that. Number twelve, I mean, most valuable yeah. tackle in the league last year. That's fantastic, but you also got three years of below average play from him as well. I mean, I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt there and say, hey, look, they've got a good player, and if they re-sign him, which they have, you know, he's he's their left tackle for the next decade, right? And that's that's worth the draft pick. And even if it was a quote-unquote reach at the time, and maybe you could have gotten him lower and whatever. I'm just trying to I'm, give some I'm, information there, but I'm I'm on board. Okay, Colton Miller's a good player. I'm I'm just saying that Raiders as as it. a you know as an institutionally anti-Raiders person, I am willing to give them full credit for that, right? The Colt Miller thing, you got it right. Well done. My point was simply, you didn't get it right with all the other reaches, right? And if you go like one for six on your reaches for in the first round, it's not good. Uh, the second point, we don't want to admit the possibility that Alex Leatherwood might actually have improved and could play as a reasonable right tackle in year two. I think there is every, there is a possibility, but it's all about range of outcomes, right? The, the bell curve, right? Where is Alex Leatherwood has improved a lot and plays as a reasonable right tackle. Where does that rank in his bell curve of distribution of possible outcomes next year? I would argue given how bad he was at right tackle in year one, that it's a pretty small possibility, right? You don't tend, I mean, you do tend to see offensive linemen get better year two, year three, and it takes them a while to hit the ground running in the NFL and you get their best play, you know, a couple of years down the road. You don't tend to get players look catastrophic and then become good. You know, they might get less catastrophic and Alex Leatherwood immediately got less catastrophic when he went from tackle to guard, but they don't tend to go from like, you know, this is abysmal to, oh, you know, he's pretty solid now. So I think it's possible. You know, I, I 100% would not say it cannot happen. I just would not, for the for a moment, put money on it. And do you want to respond to the fact that, look, I, we're projecting where the offensive line is. It doesn't necessarily matter where we are in minicamp right here. We liked Dylan Parham as a player. Yeah, I, mean, I think he plays at some point. But adding that, like, John Simpson and Denzel Good are going to be the guards – is probably not helping the case that the offensive line needs to rank higher. The main point of <laughs> you should have ranked them higher because they have Colton Miller as a good tackle and then a whole bunch of question marks, I think that's a fair point. But the mm. idea that, like, hey, guys, we got John Simpson and Denzel Good, I don't know if you've heard. Yeah, I mean, look, I whatever yeah. about those players and how they should affect the ranking of our offensive line, the one point I would make there is that we are in organized team activity mode at the moment and projecting what the offensive line looks like based off how people are running with the first and the second team in OTAs is just pointless. Like it's a waste of everybody's time. And it might look like this on the other hand, in a couple of months or in a month when training camp opens in six weeks, you know, that we might flipped entirely. And yeah, there's projection involved here, but if Dylan Parham doesn't start at guard and probably right guard, this offensive line will be worse. So I'm not sure that that's a good thing. So just, just uh, to answer, I want to answer the Leatherwood thing again quickly, because if we <laughs> if we project massive improvement for Alex Leatherwood next year, we have to do that with everybody across the league. Like when we're making these projections, I have to go to right. every single team and I have to agree with every and look, you should be optimistic as a fan. Like, I, yeah, let's let's hope that he projects. Let's let's do that. Let's project him forward. Let's say he improves. Let's say he makes Colton Miller like improvement throughout his career. Let's hope for that. Uh, but I have to, we'd have to do that for every single player across the league. And then the Raiders would still, because you, you elevated other people too, they'd still probably end up ranking in the same place. Yeah. The fourth point we need to address is PFS love, perennial love affair with the Chargers and the Broncos uh, sure. relative to the Raiders. Yeah, Not look, me. I, Not me. These are your ac accusations. All you. Well, PFF as an umbrella. You unfortunately still work for us, so you're in the umbrella. You're under the umbrella with the rest of us. Um, so, look, I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's not like any of them have been great contenders over the last couple of years, but I think we're not alone, right? This isn't the PFF thing. Everybody has been on the Chargers for the better part of a decade, being like, this is their year. This is the year the Chargers are going to be contenders, and it's never happened. But I think because there's so many people, like, it isn't crazy, right? There's a reason people look at this Chargers team 
or the roster before we head into the season and say, hey, on paper, this is a really good team. I think it's still true that assuming we get anywhere in the middle of Russell Wilson distributions, the Raiders are still working with the worst quarterback in the division. Now, it's not like they have a bad quarterback, but I still think that Derek Carr is the worst of the four um, that are available. And that's, that's the most important position in the game. The Chargers address their biggest weaknesses this offseason. They've got a ton of players. They, they're in great salary cap space. They, they should be a good team. Now, I think it's reasonable that, hey, to me, the, the ranking goes Kansas City number one, the Chargers number two. I could see a fair argument that the Raiders are ahead of Denver, even with Russell Wilson, right? It's all about kind of how that thing gels. But like, again, I don't think these are unreasonable things. Like it, just because it, this, is a, this is the best division in football. All four teams should be good. All four teams should be looking at the playoffs and thinking we can make it and we can go on a run if we get there. But obviously that won't happen, right? One of them, one of them is probably going to end up being the team that gets beaten a few times by the others and and ends up missing out. And if I'm betting money on which one that is, I'm going to pick the Raiders. I don't think that's crazy. No, that's fair. I'm not going to pile on any negative Raider stuff because I've already been pointed out as being uh, fair to the Raiders. I can't well, yeah, wait. I mean, I can't wait to see what they do. I mean, look, you could the, – the numbers would say that the Raiders overachieved last year. On the other hand, you got to give credit to guys like Max Crosby who broke out and the Casey Hayward move and uh, different things that they did to compete. Then, obviously, everything that the Raiders dealt with last offseason with John Gruden getting fired and all of that stuff in the middle of the year, they did stuck with, stick with it. And, and I might not believe – I might not agree with David Carr – that Derek is the most valuable player in the history of the world, of mankind, mm. that he's, you know, that he could land on the moon and, you know, maybe land on Mars and, you know, save the planet like Bruce Willis and Armageddon or whatever it is. I mean, that's what some people believe that's what Derek Carr is. But I think he's a very good NFL quarterback. And I have said with Devontae Adams and Darren Waller, the uh, newly paid Hunter Renfro, we're going to, we might see some crazy numbers from Derek Carr this year. We could be seeing, you know, a 5,000-yard, 40-touchdown season from Derek Carr, and it'll come down to, I believe, that – I don't want to say the it factor, but it's kind of like when do those numbers show up? Does Derek Carr become the guy that's winning games in crunch time for you? Does he, does, is he going to be that guy late? Because that's what's, I think, going to separate the AFC here, right? It's going to be a, a, a bunch of close games where it's – Who's the quarterback that's going to make plays at the very end? Carr or Herbert or Wilson or whoever it is. So the Raiders are in position to do a lot of good things, but I also think they overachieved a little bit last year, depending on how you look at it. Literally right on cue, somebody just tweeted me. Somebody called Brady Raguski uh, just tweeted, David Carr's top five tight end rankings in the NFL right now. Number one, Darren Darren Waller. Waller. Number three, Derek Carr. No, no, just <laughs> Derek Carr doesn't make an appearance in the tight end list. But Waller, George Kittle, number two, Travis Kelsey, number three, Mark Andrews, Mike Gusecki. So literally right on cue, David's out here saying, yeah, the, the Raiders, number one. See, I figured he would have gone the other way. You know, like, oh, Waller's actually tight end. It's like the worst 37. tight end in the league. This yeah. David, Derek out here propping this guy up. Yeah, David – at least when Chris Sims puts out his rankings and they look different, you know it's not – he's not – it's not because of, like, his buddies <laughs> or his friends. You know, yeah. like, he, he's, he does lock himself in his basement and watch film, and then he just comes up with his rankings or whatever it is. With Derek, it's like I hung out with Darren Waller, who's my buddies with my brother, so therefore he's number one. Yeah. Uh, you, well, sense. with him, it's like – with Chris Sims, you have no idea what his rankings will be until you see them. Right. Well, actually, that's not true because because he values you know quarterbacks his history, in particular. No. You know, because he loves toolsy guys, yeah. you can generally predict that. But with other positions, yeah, it's it's he's watching and he's going to come up with his own rankings, and he doesn't really care how they relate to everybody else's. With De- with David Carr, you can probably predict what his ra- or at least one person in his rankings based off you know his brother's team, and that's generally speaking not great analysis. You know. Yeah. Dude, I'll never forget the year that Derek uh, David Carr broke out in 2001 with Fresno. I mean, he looked incredible. He had games against 
uh, say Oregon State, maybe Colorado. He was on Prime. Which car is this? David. David. Yeah, I'm just saying David. Like I, <clears throat> I really thought he was going to be legit in the mm. NFL. Arm talent and accuracy, and there was so much that David Carr did at Fresno State that was so impressive. Of course, he goes number one overall, gets sacked 76 times his rookie season with Houston. But he, he really is one of those guys where we always talk about sack totals being somewhat dependent on the quarterback, but the O-line was still so bad there. Yeah. I always – he was that guy, right? You wonder, did like 76 sacks break him and he could never be better because he was always very conservative and yeah. check down guy after that when at Fresno State it was like, dude, this dude, this guy could push the ball down the field and be aggressive. Um, but then as an analyst, David's just very biased. That's all. Yes. Yeah, look, I, I think – it is it's a very strange dynamic and honestly it's one that's changed since the early 2000s um so you know what applies to quarterbacks now does not necessarily apply to them in 2002 2003 um but like so you know miami miami's last year their offensive line was about as bad as we've seen from an offensive line during the pff era which is 2006 onwards um, so 15, 16 years, they have the worst, about as bad an offensive line as we've seen in the league. On the other hand, it's actually, you can protect both the quarterback and the offensive line now with RPOs and just quick, you know, immediate passes, quick game, three-step drops, all this kind of stuff. Back in 2002, three, four, that stuff, RPOs basically weren't on the table at all. Um, quick game was a way smaller part of your offense. You were running I formation, you know, heavy personnel sets, fewer wide receivers in patterns. You were running, you know, seven step drops from under center. And if your offensive line was garbage, if your offensive line was five guys constructed of tissue paper, there wasn't an awful lot of way of protecting that, of, of, you know, offsetting it with the offense. So, you know, I think we would have to like run through those years with proper PFF analysis and grading and all those kinds of things. But from memory and from watching it, it feels like David Carr was broken by an offensive line that was prohibitively bad. And I, I think it's still true that you can break a quarterback with an overwhelming amount of pressure. And once that happens, it's very difficult to put him back together again. And that happened to David Carr. I think that happened to Mark Bulger with the Rams, I think it happened to Kurt Warner with the Rams. And then Warner did manage to put himself back together again with the, you know, had a stint with the Giants, then went to Arizona and kind of re rebuilt himself. But Warner was, was physically broken by that offensive line as well as a little bit mentally. So yeah, like a terrible offensive line can still be absolutely crippling to a quarterback, even if now I think it's gotten a little bit easier to prevent that. I, I hate. I'm sorry. We've gone down this David Carr rabbit hole. We do have one full season of his graded. It was 2006, so that was his you know fourth year in the league, fifth year in the league. Um, average depth of target of only six, six point one. So I think that's again what he ended up as is very conservative quarterback. Um, as I um, as I do, I watch you know old football games in the background while I'm working. There mm. was an 03 game, Byron Leftwich versus David Carr. Leftwich is a rookie. Carr's in year two. And the announcers are like, this is Marino <laughs> Kelly for the next 10 years. AFC South, watch out. Carr, left which next 10 years. This is the battle. This is battle one of, you know, a million. And um, I don't know. It just it just didn't pan out. Just didn't Announcers pan out. love nothing more than two young quarterbacks squaring off in year one or year two, yeah. you know? Oh, that's yeah. the next that's the next one for the next for the next decade or so car left right. which one yeah Can we get on to the next email yeah let's go this one's good because it's a man who knows how to game the system you know the pff mailbag is not immune from being manipulated and this guy has managed to hit on that perfectly so first of all uh first off hope you're doing well huge fan of the pod excellent work you're doing the charity drives as a fan from England, where even the furthest football away day is a round trip of just 668 miles, Plymouth and Newcastle, of course. Uh, one thing that's always struck me as a little odd with the NFL is the geographical makeup of the divisions. The best soccer rivalries include teams in close proximity, 
Uh, it's a touch different in the U.S. where everything is so spread out. However, how on earth are both, aren't both New York teams in the same division? I haven't fact-checked this, but it looks as though there's at least 10 franchises closer to the Miami Dolphins than the other three teams within their division. What a complete waste of fuel, petrol, carbon, monox- or carbon dioxide, and getting these teams to travel so far, so often, and so unnecessarily with the world finally paying more attention to sustainability and building a better future, trademark. Uh, it's crazy to me that the amount of air miles NFL teams rack up. Using the Dolphins example from above, imagine them being in a division with the Bucks, the Jags, and the Falcons. Surely less travel would have a positive impact on player health and therefore performance. Everybody's a winner. So my question to you fine gentlemen is, if a division uh, is, if a division realignment were to take place, do you think there would be widespread team rebuilding to prepare? Again, using the Dolphins example, if they were in that hypothetical division, how much would it impact their decision making? Warm weather, home comforts, more practice time, et cetera, plus obviously the way those teams are actually constructed. He's taken a stab at realigning the divisions based on proximity. Uh, what would you both say they are the friskiest looking divisions? I enjoy how each team has their own unique contrasting style sizzle. And yes, the NFC North is pretty spot on as it is. Now, here's the critical line. I've tried to send this email, or tried to time the sending of this email so that it reaches you whilst there's literally nothing else going on. So fingers crossed, it makes it in. Uh, appreciate your time, Charlie. So, so a cu- couple things here. I, I appreciate that Charlie from England has had this thing in his drafts since like the winter. And he was like, mid-June. Mid-June is when we hit the send button on this thing. Um, Secondly, I feel like Charlie from England has added a proposal into, like, the Green New Deal or something like that. This is how we're going to save the planet by realigning the NFL and cutting back on travel. So, uh, never know. This is going to be hitting – it's going to be on, like, Congress's desk, you know, within the next couple of years, the realignment. Let me – Third me fire the image of the division to Tyler and hopefully he can fire it on the screen and we can see what we're working with here. The third but, thing, uh, um, the Arizona Cardinals were once in the NFC East. I thought that was, that was always hilarious when the Cardinals were in the NFC East with the Giants, the Eagles, the Cowboys, and well, they also the started Washington off in Chicago, team. you know, like, no, I know, I know, but, but there was still a point where the Phoenix Cardinals. And eventually the Arizona Cardinals were in the, N- the NFC East before they realigned yeah. back so in 2002. That's one of the points in all this, right? Is that A, teams have moved places, right? So the yeah. Arizona Cardinals, formerly the Phoenix Cardinals and blah, blah, blah. They started off as the Chicago Cardinals back in the, like the 1920s, right? So geographically, their division made an awful lot more sense at one point you know, when they were based somewhere completely different. And that is true for a few of these teams. It's also because of the way the NFL uh, has kind of created with, you know, the NFL and the AA, what is it, the AAFC, the thing that the 49ers and those teams came from way back in the, whatever it was, the 50s. Um, Cleveland as well, I think, came from that league. And then the AFL, with the which merged and, and created those, the, the AFC largely, you know, these teams have come from a sort of weird historical standpoint. And when they've been messing with divisions in the past, they've tried to keep some of these historical rivalries intact, right? At the cost sometimes of making any kind of geographical sense. Um, but I agree. It, it, I do wonder, like, what if you just said to hell with the, the historical stuff? What if you just threw all these teams in a pot and then, you know, reorganized geographically? Obviously, people would object in year one or year two, but like five years down the line, would anybody give a crap? New rivalries. It'd be new rivalries. I, I'm in. I just want, I like seeing the new stuff. So, which one of these divisions is realigned divisions do you think is the most interesting? I don't know if it's the most interesting, but I like the idea of Florida and the Falcons, like all those teams. Yeah. All that. I mean, that, that makes Southeast. a lot of sense geographically. Right. Um, I think they, well, I don't even know. They don't, we don't have titles on these. But the division that is the Patriots, Jets, Giants, and Bills. You have the three New York teams. The New York division. Yeah, the New York division. Because the Patriots, I mean, they're in, they're in Foxborough. Even if only one of those teams in New York. It's basically like Eastern New York out there. It's not, it's not Massachusetts anymore. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Patriots and all the New York teams, I think, is 
is That's fascinating. Cool I, I think the mid Atlantic is at the mid Atlantic, the Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. So you get the Pennsylvania rivalry, and then you get the DC area rivalry with Baltimore and Washington. There, I think that looks awesome as well. Yeah, the NFC I, North also, is exactly the same. By the way, yes, yeah, well done. And then I think the Texas division gets pretty interesting. You know, we get the oh wait, hang on, we don't have Dallas in the Texas division. Where is Dallas? Where Dallas? Dallas is there? over there with the Cardinals, the Raiders, and the Broncos. Hmm. See, I would kick. I would reorganize this. I would kick. This doesn't work for the other division. But if you kick Tennessee out of this one, and you end up with New Orleans, Houston, Dallas, and Kansas City, that's a fun division. Oh yeah, that could be that could be really good. But I think yeah, Houston and Dallas would have to be in the same division for sure. New Orleans there makes sense. Yeah, see, it gets a little tricky at one point. But Dallas going from a team that's in the East to actually, you know, playing playing teams that are closer geographically, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. By that. Um, but, I mean, I think, to me, I would be all for reorganizing divisions that make geographic sense. I understand why the NFL hasn't, because they've come from this, this place of historical – you know, rivalries and long-term things, but I honestly don't know if people would care that much down the line, right? Like they tinkered with divisions before and teams have moved from one, you know, one division or one conference or whatever. And yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm sure you miss out on something, you know, oh, we miss out playing this team twice a year or whatever that we've done for God knows how many years. But like now, does anybody care? Well, with, with the 17th game, here's what you could do here. First off, with the 17th game, you could keep like one sticky rival or something like that. It would, it would, mm. They do that in college a lot, right? They did that in the SEC where it's like, right. hey, uh, Auburn and Georgia, you guys got to play each other every year. Florida and LSU, you're playing each other every year. No matter what, you're in different divisions. Um, so you keep one sticky rival, could be game 17, whatever. And then if, if you're already going to play them anyway, then it becomes a secondary rival or whatever it is. Um, there's ways to do it. The other thing is, like, yeah, first off, Cowboys, Eagles, those games draw. Cowboys, Giants, like those games draw because they're big fan bases or whatever. But when we're force fed Cowboys, Giants on prime time every year, no matter how good the teams are, right? And it's like, well, here's, uh, we got Daniel Jones going up against Cooper Rush this week, but it's Cowboys, Giants, got to have it, you know? We don't need, maybe you don't need to have those games anymore. Or they become the, the, the sticky rival and you get it once a year, but it mixes things up. It mixes things up. I, I, I'm all for it. Like just re do it every 10 years. I mean, I rivalries every 10 years. I think that's just an issue of like, I mean, that's just divisions, right? No matter what division you end up, you're going to end up with a couple of years where there's teams that play each other that both stink and there's no way of avoiding that. Yeah. Um, also, by the way, so this is part of like, if you ever draw these teams on a map and start trying to cluster them geographically, there are certain teams or certain franchises that are just positioned in such a way they're going to they're going to screw up anything you draw up, right? Yeah. So Seattle in particular, right? Like if you were draw, drawing up the four closest teams in out west, like obviously the two Los Angeles teams are right there, but like Denver, Las maybe? Vegas is probably closer than than San Francisco or it's certainly closer than Seattle. But you have to have Seattle, no, otherwise Seattle. they're literally sitting there on their own. I think with Seattle, the closest would be San Francisco and then probably Vegas yes. and Denver. But that's one's, but to the, Not LA. to the two, like yeah. if you were clustering the Western teams, right, you would have the two Los Angeles teams and then probably San Francisco and Las Vegas as the four closest. Yeah. But you can't do that because you have to have Seattle because there's nobody close to them. Look at you, U.S. geography expert here. Well, having driven 3,600 miles across the country now, I'm, I'm – well, quite well versed with the South now. Yeah. That was my weak link. That was my my sketchy area. But do, now I'm you should now do I ninety. You should do like an I ninety drive from Boston to Seattle through Montana. I kinda did that already. Okay. Um like a long time ago. Uh I did a sort of solo road trip that did more of the northern stuff. So I was kind of okay there anyway. Now I don't know how far north that took me. I went through like Nebraska and Wyoming, you know, not a lot there. Um no. But I didn't. I haven't been as north as like Montana and Idaho and that kind of stuff. Montana, what a summer! What a summer in Montana. 
<laughs> well, yeah. So I kind of like look. I kind of like the shakeup. I think the O2 shakeup. The same year David Carr was drafted. That was when they went from five, uh, six divisions to eight divisions, four per team, uh, four teams per division. And you know, that was 2002. We're 20 years removed from that big move. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's time to just shake it up again. Well, by the way, the other thing that's going to make a mess of this is, you know, if and when the NFL goes to an 18 game schedule and starts expanding to Europe, you know, a London franchise, a Germany yeah. franchise, a Mexico city franchise, like <clears throat> wherever they're planning on expanding to and whatever that does to the schedule, to the, the, the alignment of divisions, et cetera, like <laughs> any saving you make in like clustering the geographic, like the Florida, you know, division and stuff, is going to get blown out of the freaking water by the trip everybody has to make to Germany every year, you know? And like your air miles thing, you're just the carbon offset you're doing there just isn't getting it done. I will, I'll believe that when I see it though. The London team, the Germany team. I mean, Mike, Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk, he mentioned a few months ago, he truly believes the NFL is going to get to like 40 teams. Yeah. Right? He, he thinks expansions imminent not not moving right because for years there were rumors all oh, the jaguars are gonna move to london or the chargers right. are gonna move to london he's saying they're gonna expand they're gonna get to 34 mm -hmm. and then before you know it it's 36 38 and we're gonna be at 40 teams and i don't i mean to eight more teams is massive i don't know when you get there but who the heck knows man i mean even if that coincides with the ncaa being completely overhauled if you had to add six to eight more teams to the nfl you'd have to start taking 20 year olds and 19 year olds from college probably just to make sure that the product wasn't so watered down yeah i mean even i mean even forgetting a franchise being constructed you know in germany or london or whatever it is like the games they're taking place there um are offsetting any realignment you do in terms of geographic and, and all that kind of stuff like seattle are going to travel twenty nine thousand miles this year from like for their games, right? 34 time zones. Uh, the Denver Broncos are going to travel 27,000 miles. Um, so any team that's playing in Europe essentially is going to travel through the moon. Like the Pittsburgh Steelers actually have a really tight geographic schedule this year. They travel six. You know, you could probably do that with a bunch of teams. And certainly if you realign the division so they make geographical sense, you're going to have a bunch of teams that are only flying 6,000 miles that are saving all the carbon, blah, blah. But the second anybody has to hike themselves on a plane and schlep over to Frankfurt or wherever they're going, like, forget it. That's that's taking up the carbon footprint of like three teams. The Seahawks are making that trip this year. Bucks and Seahawks playing in Germany. Yeah. This, this I season. mean, Seattle going to Germany. That's crazy. That's ugly. Anyway, it was fun, fun exercise here by uh, Charlie from England just to uh, maybe realign the divisions. Let us know. And to exploit the uh, the loopholes in the PFF mailbox. Yeah, so if you've got like a really good topic, one that's going to make it on the podcast that we could break down like the schedule realignment, June 1st through the 25th is probably a really good window to send that in. Maybe even like May 15th <laughs> to July 15th, I would say, is your best emailing window if you want to, if you have a big topic that can make it on the podcast. But I would point out that the the novelty of highlighting that that was what you were doing, you know, the, the sort of yeah. the I know that you know that I know thing yep. of I'm just going to say it in the email, like I'm gaming the system right here. That's probably only going to work, work once, yeah. you know, like that amused me this time that the guy like literally wrote out, hey, I'm trying to game your email system so that my email gets that's read aloud. They're like, I appreciate your honesty. That made me laugh. Well done. And I will. I will accommodate that by putting it on the podcast this week. I don't think that works two times in a row. You know, the next guy that writes his, his email and is like, hey, I'm trying to game your email system. Well, now I'm just going to be like, yeah, but somebody already did that and I'm, I'm over that. So, but no. I, I, we appreciate honesty here. You know, we're honest with you, our viewers and our listeners. We talk all the time. Look, if we're, if something unprofessional happens, if, if, you know, when we're, we're going to miss Austin wrestling up on the second floor, we don't, play through it and ignore it we acknowledge it we're just honest about what's happening here outside the sponsors sitting outside here who knows um we just we just talk tell the truth here so yeah you can tell us the truth why you're sending the email we'll just see if it works a second time or make something else up <laughs> but tell us the truth don't make it up
All right. We're back here Monday? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. You here, here? Um, you going to be in the studio Monday? I'm definitely back in Cincinnati. I'm say. not 100% sure if I'm in the studio yet, but hopefully. Um, by the way, I want to remind everybody, 25% off using the promo code NFLPOD, 25% off any PFF subscription, of course. You can always get in touch with us. We've got all the various ways. You can email us, nflpodcast at, uh, at uh, pff.com. Jeez. Um, at PFF NFL Pod. Is that right? For Twitter? Yes. I need to see it on the screen. Um, in all the various places, you can get in touch with us. At PFF NFL Podcast <laughs> on TikTok. You can follow us. All these places you can get in touch. Send those emails May 15th to July 15th, that hot window right in the middle of it. This is the best time to do your underdog uh, draft your underdog team and also send the emails. This is the time of year to do all that. Do you want to talk about Gronk's retirement at all? I mean, is he retired? They said maybe Tommy can call him, right? Like you probably, yeah. you know, like, hey, Russell Gage is banged up. Like, look, call I'm not Gronk. I'm not buying any retirement that is immediately followed by his agent, his agent saying, yeah, but look, if somebody calls him in the season, they're like, hey, we really need you, Is he, Gronk, he might play. Does Gronk just not want to do training camp? Yeah, Gronk has become Brett Favre at this point, right? Yeah. It's like, look, or Michael Strahan, you know, any of these guys that reach the end and were like, hey, look, I just don't want to do training camp. And right now it's mandatory, right? So there's no, like, skipping it. You can't just be like, hey, I'm not showing up. You get fined. So the only way around that is to retire oh, so you and think, then to unretire. So you think he'll be back? Yeah, I'm. I'm certainly. Look, like is I he going to come back in forty days, like Brady? Like, what is forty days from now? Is it probably? A, it's like the end of training camp or something. It's probably right in the right, the right area. All right. Yeah. Um, he said, look, "I'm just if Tommy's going to retire, I'm going to retire and come back too." I'm not. I'm not buying any retirement that is immediately followed by his own agent saying, "Yeah, but you know, if somebody picks up my, the phone, he might be back." My one concern is the last time Gronk retired and became a world champion in wrestling. He kind of didn't have the same athleticism when he came back. So if he's just hoping to, you know, miss training camp and, yeah, I'm a veteran, I want to miss out on the grind. If he does come back week one, week eight, week 10, week whatever, is he even going to be useful at that point? Because we've seen yeah, Gronk without fuck? that full – like last year he was kind of back as far as athleticism yeah. goes. We, he hasn't always been that guy. Right, but the last time he took like a full year off and, you know, got thin and, you know, w was not keeping himself in football shape. Like, even if, even if this, like, even if he spent, it, even if he sits on a couch between now and, you know, 40 days time, the entirety of training camp then gets called up. Like, he's not, he hasn't lost that much, right? And he can spend the first six weeks of the season getting into football shape because they don't need him until, you know, the crunch time. I don't think there's a concern that we're going to see Gronk turn into, you know, post first retirement Gronk. I don't think he has the time to let that happen. All right. Well, Gronk, as of now, retired. He's now retired uh, in the same offseason that Tom Brady's retired. By the way, one more, I mean, bit of news. This almost seems a little bit too flippant, but do, Ravens lost a couple of guys yesterday, right? Um, yeah. Ferguson, their, their pass rusher, and then Tony Siragusa who Tony Siragusa was, you know, a big defensive tackle for that 2000 Ravens defense. Uh, he was there for five or seven years or something in his career. Um, and was just this incredibly amazing, like this incredible personality for the Ravens. And then, you know, a lot of, depending on your age, you'll know him as like a sideline reporter as well. He got a gig for, I think, Fox, right? It was Tony, Tony Goose and Moose or Tony Moose and Goose or whatever it was. Um, was the combination they had there with Daryl Moose Johnson and then Sura Goose, who was the sideline guy. And then whenever he lost that gig, he just kind of faded away, right? It just wasn't wasn't in the football world anymore, um, which I think is a shame because when you start looking at all these old clips that surface on uh, Twitter and, and elsewhere on social media, like that guy was just awesome. He was funny. He was, fantastic. He, was he had a great personality. He was just an amazing guy to, to you know, be around and, and hear stories about and watch uh, and watch play as well um it's just you know it's an incredibly sad day for for baltimore and he was only in his 50s i think he was 55 or something um 
there was a clip that was going around from, I think, a Howard Stern show years ago where Suragusa's dad had passed away from a massive heart attack at like 48. Um, and, you know, Suragusa at 55, like just tremendously sad day for Baltimore, but also for anybody that, you know, remembers him and watched him play, watched him be a personality in anywhere. Yeah, crazy. I mean, uh, Jalen Ferguson was three years, four years into his career with the Ravens. Um, not sure what the reports were there. And then, yeah, Siragusa, um, fantastic player and even better personality, right, overall. That was what um, I think made Siragusa even more famous, you know, was his personality and, you know, some of the off-field stuff that he had done. He also, so. he was a guy, you know, he was like 340 pounds, like a proper old-school nose tackle who – was not like a gym rat you know what hated being in the weight room like didn't like <laughs> didn't like working out just had this like natural old school big guy strength you know what i mean yeah. just, like just these guys that are naturally you know that that statement that you hear every now and again oh, no people are naturally 340 pounds well like he was and was naturally the kind of strength that 340 pounds gives you and you know just just was a dude that was able to like just put some pads on over the t-shirt and I'll go out there and manhandle like offensive linemen in the NFL. There, there was also because Siragusa, he paired with Sam Adams mm. on that Ravens 2000 defense. They were both about 340 pounds. And you know, most teams had a nose tackle and a three technique, right? Like they do today, or they just had a nose tackle because they were three four team. Well, the Ravens came out there essentially with two huge nose tackles. Maybe Ray Lewis wasn't even that good. He was just protected by the two 350-pounders <laughs> in front of him. But, but that started to become – we always talk about, like, the copycat league and all that stuff. Teams started to try to replicate that. I mean, uh, right after that happened, the Jaguars drafted Marcus Stroud and John Henderson in back-to-back -back drafts. I mean, teams started to try to replicate what the Ravens did with the two huge monsters – on the ins, uh, you know, at defensive tackle to keep the linebacker clean and all that fun stuff. So, um, yeah, the goose, he was, he was a part of all that. The, I think the very first hard knocks they ever did was one of those early Ravens teams. It wasn't the 2000 Ravens, but it was what, 2006, seven, something like that. Um, no, it was, and it, it was, would have been like, I think maybe right after the Super Bowl. It was early because they used to oh one, oh two. Okay, they started, whatever they started it was, it was one of there. those early Ravens teams and it had Tony Siragusa on it, it had Shannon Sharp on it, Todd Heap was a rookie I think that year and particularly the like the interplay the dynamic the relationship the like the winding up and the hazing between Siragusa and Shannon Sharp was freaking hilarious like if you get a chance to go back and watch that first season of Hard Knocks it's amazing to watch it was the best hard knocks because it had those personalities. You could never replicate what the Ravens had back then in part because of Siragusa. So anyway, yeah, sad day for the NFL yesterday. Yeah. So with that, thanks to everybody for tuning in. We appreciate everybody, all of our viewers, all of our listeners. As we said last time, tell a friend, you know, this off season, Hey, looking for a new podcast to listen to go check out the PFF NFL podcast. We're in off-season mode, but you know as soon as training camp gets here, we're going to crank it up with um, top five NFL analysis. I don't want to say we're the best, or at least like top five, right? NFL podcast, I think. Sure. We, we want to be number one. We want to be the best. So tell a friend, spread the word, and, uh, you know, let's continue to grow this thing. We appreciate everybody for tuning in and watching. We'll be back on Monday. More NFL analysis.